Well, good morning, church family. If you will, let's stand and let us worship God. Here we go. We've waited for this day. Mike Pittman, I want to welcome you here. So glad that you joined us at Woodland Park Baptist Church. If you're our guest today, like, uh, if you would, you could either text hello to the number that's shown on the screen here or fill out the tab in the bulletin and either put it in the, the offering plate or at the welcome center in between the two double doors out in the foyer. Again, welcome. So thankful that you came here to join us today. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we sing.
stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him
chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, it says, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And when they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, 
he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. In Salt Lake City, everybody is Mormon. Maybe 98% people is lost. Everybody talk about growing a big church. I don't want big churches, I want more churches. In the city, when everyone is Mormon, it's easy to feel alone. In West Valley City, 42% is Hispanic people. It's hard for the Hispanic people to live in, in the United States. The people have two or three jobs. I see the, the fruit for the Hispanic in, in this community. One example is Jose. He is a new leader in our church. I came to the Utah from El Salvador. I found work. He has a, a graphic design. I thought I was coming to America just to work. I did not realize God had another plan. Jose loves Jesus. He has a passion to see the, the people change it. I never think myself as a pastor, but I had been at Luis Church. He came to me about helping start a new church in an, another community. That was something I never pictured myself doing. But Luis is teaching me, and now I think I'm ready. When you see brothers going to plant new churches, it's a sacrifice, but that heart is necessary. I'm grateful for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. It helped my life, my ministry, my family. This church is not possible if not have an Annie Armstrong offering. I have a dream to see very soon new churches everywhere in Salt Lake City, Utah. This is our passion, this is our goal. I live for that. This is the Great Commission. Our church supports ministries like that one in several different ways. One of them is that out of everything that comes in our offering plates, uh, about 14% of that goes to help ministries away from our church. And so we're grateful for all of those gifts that help us do church here. But we understand we're not the only church and we're not the only place that ministry needs to happen. So out of our regular giving, uh, about 14% goes to different ministries, including ministries like that one. Then our church also has... 
uh, a fund that's called the Global Impact Offering, uh, which is money that is 100% that goes to ministries away from our church. And so our church matters. Our church is really important. I hope that you believe that, and I hope that you know that. Uh, but we also want to generate a spirit where we are a generous church, and we also believe in ministry that happens away from here as well. And we are excited to give to ministry that happens maybe in places that we'll never even see. So those are two different ways in which you can be involved in ministries like that one in Salt Lake City. And I think last week we looked at Minneapolis and all across uh, North America. I want to turn your attention uh, to Luke chapter 5. And uh, I'm really excited uh, about this new series of messages where we talk about being a follower. We talk about being a disciple. In fact, we're going to use this as kind of our lead up to the resurrection season where we as a church begin to spend some time thinking and preparing for to remember Jesus' death and resurrection. And in fact, one of the ways in which we're going to do that is that we're going to look at really the middle section of the gospel, particularly the gospel of Luke, where we uh, take a look at Jesus' own preparation uh, toward Holy Week and to the, toward his death and to his resurrection. One of the things that we're going to do is that we're going to look at it through the eyes of the disciples. I want you to think about those disciples and just really, I want you to be amazed by those disciples. I want you to be jealous of those disciples a little bit. I want you to think about the life that those disciples had walking with Jesus. Do you realize how close these guys were to Jesus? Do you realize how much of a front row seat they had for all of the miracles that Jesus performed, the resurrections, the, the healings, the, the casting out of demons? You know how much they had a front row seat every time that Jesus opened up the word of God and explained it either in public or in their small circle? I mean, they were right there for all of those events. Not only that, but I mean, they just lived with Jesus. I mean, they spent this time where literally they were an arm's length away from Jesus. I mean, almost at any time, they could just reach out their hand and put their hand on Jesus. That's how close they were to Jesus. In fact, they were so close to Jesus and lived so close to Jesus, they could tell you whether Jesus was right-handed or left-handed. They, they, they watched him eat. They, they observe those kinds of things. Hey, in fact, I was even thinking about it this week. They lived so close to Jesus that they could tell you whether Jesus snored or not. Now, there was a little bit that I was thinking maybe Jesus didn't snore because he was perfect. But then I realized that snoring is not a sin, no matter what my wife tells you. Uh, it, is, it is okay. It is a sign of being a human being. And Jesus became fully in the flesh. But the point is, is that those disciples lived so close to him that they would know and observe all of those details about Jesus' life. Now, on the one hand, you and I can live jealous of that proximity that they had. But on the other hand, you and I are blessed because we have been given the word of God and we have been given the, the presentation of the stories of those disciples through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels that tell us, hey, this is what it was like to literally walk in the footprints of Jesus. And so what we're going to try to do is that we're going to try to slide into those guys' sandals and just try to get the sense of what did it feel like to live that close to Jesus? And what does that mean for the way that we live today? The opening couple of months that we spent together as pastor and church, uh, we spent time uh, thinking about life as a church. And what does it mean to be the church? And I'm convinced that that's what we were supposed to do for those couple of months. But I'm excited about the next couple of months because it's going to turn and say, okay, but what does this mean for my life? How do I live up close and teachable with Jesus? How do I live that out in my own life? And so I'm excited about these things. So let's pray, and then we're going to dig into the Word of God. Our Heavenly Father, and we are so blessed. We are so blessed to be given your Word. So, Lord, that we can slip in to this position and see what it was like to live arm's length away from you. Lord, I pray that we would place ourselves right here in the text. And, Lord, in a different way, but in the same way at the same time, 
Lord, that we would have an encounter with you through your word this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. So as we look at this passage, you know, uh, there's a couple things that I want you to see about what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, I want you to see, first of all, I want you to see that Jesus draws a crowd. Jesus draws a crown. That's the unmistakable headline at the beginning of this passage of Scripture. In fact, this is a really interesting chapter because it is a transition from Luke chapter 4 to Luke chapter 5. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is being introduced as a public character. You see, for 30 years, he lived as a quiet carpenter that probably nobody even noticed or paid attention to. I imagine he probably did some pretty good work, but he was just the carpenter down the street. But now, as he launches his public ministry, beginning with his uh, baptism uh, by John the Baptist, and then he begins to go into the synagogues and unroll the scrolls and say, (laughs) this is great. He says, this passage of scripture that I just read about, it's talking about me. Whoo, man. When he begins to do that, And then people begin to talk about, did you hear this guy, Jesus? He walked into the synagogue, rolled the scroll and said, that's about me. And then not only that, but he begins to heal people. He begins to cast out demons. He begins to do miracle after miracle. That starts to draw some attention. And people begin to just kind of are drawn to him. And now it begins to be the place where everywhere Jesus goes, people are crushing in to try to get a piece of Jesus and to get close uh, to Jesus. In fact, here in the beginning of Luke chapter 5, we see that he is walking walking along the, uh, the lakeside and the crowd of people coming on the, uh, on the lake or to the lake is so large and nobody's like, hey, let's all give Jesus plenty of space. They're all just trying to see from the back to the front, how close can I get to Jesus that he is almost pushed into the water. And so he looks and he sees these fishing boats. He says, I'm going to just get in one of these fishing boats. Kind of gives a nod to Simon and says, it's okay. And he gets in Simon. Now, Simon here is Simon Peter, the, the guy that you've heard of before. But he gets in Simon's uh, boat. Now, what is it about Jesus that drew this kind of crowd? It's really kind of hard to say. There was some of it that I think was a little bit of a celebrity culture. Man, people were talking about Jesus. People were saying, man, did you hear about Jesus? Did you see Jesus? And when, so when Jesus comes to town, the word kind of gets out. People are whispering and, 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 and hey, Jesus is on his way there. And they want to get their picture with Jesus. They, 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 they want to get Jesus' autograph. They, they want to get as close to Jesus as they can. So some of it is just he's a famous person. But there's also another part of it. That I think that as Jesus began to teach and as Jesus exuded the deity of Christ, people just began to say that this is a teacher that is speaking to the deepest needs that are in my life. And so they were drawn to him. Now, the truth of the matter is, as we're going to see throughout the gospel, as you know from the stories of the gospels, man, they they only know this much about who Jesus is. And most of the time, they they are quite a bit behind in understanding who Jesus is. And sometimes they'll get completely wrong as to who Jesus is. But what they knew and what they noticed is that Jesus spoke into the deepest needs of their life. You know, we are always seeking after someone who can help us make sense of life. We, we, we make people bestsellers all the time. We make people popular on TV. We, we make people popular on the internet. What's the biggest reason? Because they help me make sense of my life. We're still searching for someone who helps us to make sense of our life. I want you to know that Jesus still draws a crowd today. You know, as I was thinking about that in this week and saying, you know, looking at that and trying to compare Jesus to this day. And sometimes we think that, man, our culture is losing interest in Jesus and Jesus isn't that big a deal. I want you to know that Jesus still draws a crowd today. Don't don't believe me? Let me just mention a couple of things. When your coworkers who haven't given a thought to the things of God go through a crisis. I promise you, 9.4 out of 10 pray to Jesus. They call out to Jesus. They they, they know that, that, man, when, when when the rubber hits the road, when something difficult happens, there is a reflex inside of them to say, I wonder if Jesus is the one who can help me make sense of the life that I'm in right now. I want you to know that churches across our country are full of folks today 
Even folks that aren't even fully committed to Jesus, but they are drawn to a place like this because they sense maybe in that place I'll be able to discover something about Jesus which will help me be able to discover something about me. And for 2,000 years now, people have been seeking after Jesus to help them understand who it is inside of them. I'll tell you one more evidence that Jesus still draws a crowd. You can watch this. It's going to happen, all right? And then you'll say, oh, that's what Pastor Tim was talking about. In the next two weeks, Jesus' face is going to be on more magazine covers than any other celebrity for the next month. Now, the reason for that is because we're heading into the Easter season. And either Time or Newsweek is going to put Jesus on the cover. Now, they're going to probably say something silly about Jesus. But they're going to try to sell magazines. And Life is going to put out a commemorative edition uh, about Jesus. And you're going to see even the weekly world news is going to find a way to say something about Jesus. Now, why? Is that because they're deep believers? No. But they know that the name of Jesus still draws a crowd and still sells magazines. People today are still drawn to Jesus. That's an amazing, amazing truth. Now, just like in the first century, as in our century, they don't always understand what Jesus is. They don't understand what it means. They're, they're, their understanding of that is confusing. But hear me, Jesus still draws people to his name and to his character and to his identity. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we get church right. It's so important that you and I get our faith right because we are the ones carrying around pictures, living pictures of who Jesus is. And people are hungry to find a person who knows Jesus. So wherever where Jesus went in his day, and I still tell you that where he lives today, he draws a crowd. But I also want you to see that not only does Jesus draw a crowd, but Jesus speaks directly to a real person. Jesus speaks to a real person. Because here's the thing. Man, this is what, I mean, if we could list a billion things to love about Jesus, this would be top five, okay? That is that Jesus is the creator God. He is responsible. He knows. He, he, he knows the DNA. He, he knows the largeness and the vastness of this universe. And yet he knows each person by name and each person and each story and each need and each backstory and each future. You see, Jesus, as much as he is cosmic in power, is personal in relationship. And so in this passage of scripture where we look in these opening 11, 12 verses of Luke chapter 5, it is the story of the crowd that's pushing in on Jesus. But before we know it, it's a conversation between Jesus and one person. That's the way Jesus works. He is the cosmic God who has personal relationships. In fact, there was this one time that Jesus is walking through the crowd and he's trying to just get from one place to the next place and then everyone's just trying to try to follow and, and particularly since it's just a, a traveling trip, everyone is jostling and trying to get a hold of him and maybe even some people are just trying to touch Jesus and, and Jesus says, stop, somebody just touched me. And the disciples are just, I mean, they're incredulous. They're like, what do you mean someone just touched you. This is a roving mosh pit. Uh, of course someone touched you. This is just a crazy thing. What do you mean someone touched you? And Jesus says, I know that somebody in faith has just touched me. And they were healed. And this whole parade of people that are just going from one place to another, he stops and he pays attention to this one person. Because Jesus is aware of the crowd, but he relates to the person. And that's what we see here is he focuses in on Peter. He borrows Peter. Uh, the text calls him Simon. The text calls him Simon Peter. But it, the, the, um, he borrows Peter's boats for this preaching uh, opportunity. And, and almost as though he wants to pay Peter some rent for borrowing the, the, the rent he wants to do Peter a favor. He says, listen, take the boat out and go out to the deep and drop your nets. And Peter, I, I'm not saying that it, the text says this, but but I've got kids. I know when your kids kind of just roll their eyes at you. I know what that sounds like. It kind of feels like Peter rolls his eyes at Jesus here. He says, Jesus, we were out all night. We didn't catch anything. But because you said so, we'll do it. Now, there's a little bit of a practical thing that I learned this week about the way that they fish is that they would fish with these linen nets. We think about these nets with the, you know, 
Can you picture that? Okay. I worked on that all week uh, to be able to draw a, a net. Uh, <laughs> but it was these linen nets, and the linen nets would be very easy for the fish to see in daylight. But at night, they wouldn't see it, so they would swim into the net, swoop it up, catch your fish. And so, like, nobody fished during the daytime. And so Jesus says, take your, the boat out, drop the nets. Peter's like, man, we were out all night. We didn't catch anything, but because you said so, we'll do it. And they take it out there, drop the nets. And almost instantaneously, we get the sense, the nets begin to fill up. And the nets begin to fill up so much that they begin to pull them in. And Peter has to wave over to some partners and say, man, I'm going to need some help with this. <laughs> Boy, he kind of shut up real quick, didn't he? I'm going to need some help with this. And they pull them into the boats. And then it tells us that the boats almost began to sink. Now, keep in mind, these boats were designed for one thing, floating while you catch fish. I mean, that, that, that was the whole design. And yet here they are bursting at their capabilities. And it tells us that Peter, seeing the great catch, he falls on his knees in amazement. It says that he falls on his knees. And in fact, he doesn't, he's not just amazed, but something different happens in this place. He falls on his knees in confession. And he looks at Jesus and says, depart from me. For I am a sinner. Now that's kind of a strange response there. I mean, you would think that the last man, he would think, man, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is so awesome. Jesus, you're great. Jesus, I was wrong about the whole daylight fishing. I, 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 no, his response is, I'm a sinner. Depart from me. You see, this is the thing that I love here. This isn't the first time, this is when Peter becomes a disciple, but this isn't the first time that Peter had spent time with Jesus. In fact, this isn't even the first time, now this is amazing, this isn't even the first time that Jesus had done a miracle for Peter. Because if you scan back to the chapter before, in chapter 4, Peter's mother-in-law is sick to the point of death, and Jesus comes to Peter's house and heals his mother-in-law. Peter's already had a front row seat for one miracle. And throughout Luke chapter 4, every time Jesus does one of these things, it says the people are amazed. That's the crowd. They're amazed. But in this moment, something changes inside of Peter. And he is amazed, and then he is overwhelmed. He says, depart from me. I am a sinner. You are too big for me to take hold of. This is a bigger deal than I'm capable of handling. Now listen, we can say an awful lot of stuff about Peter. Peter's middle name was Knucklehead. Um, that's in some translations. And there's a lot, we, we can chuckle at Peter and, 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 and Peter gets all kinds of things wrong and he puts his foot in his mouth. But let me tell you something that Peter gets right. When something big happens, Peter's one of the first people to notice. When God moves, Peter drops everything and he chases after that. Listen, it's okay to be a knucklehead. I mean, here's the goal. We don't want to be a knucklehead the same way twice. We, we want to be knuckleheads in a new way. We want to learn along the way. But don't be the knucklehead the same way twice. But man, it's okay to put your foot in your mouth sometimes. It's okay to be dumb. It's okay to be confused. But if you and I can have that pull inside of our heart that when God moves, we notice, and we're willing to drop everything in that moment, sign me up for that. Uh, I, I want to be that. I want to be that. So something changes inside of Peter. He's seen Jesus. He knows Jesus. He's even watched Jesus do miracles before. But in this moment, one-on-one, -on -one, his life changes as he sees who Jesus is. It's huge. Now, real quick, that's the kind of moment and that's the kind of experience that, that I pray for all of you to have. That's the kind of moment and experience that you must have where you can shift from knowing about Jesus, even from being amazed by Jesus, 
to the day in which you're overwhelmed by Jesus. You say, man, my life is in such desperate need of Jesus. Depart from me, Jesus, I'm not going anywhere. I'm coming in, is what Jesus says. So Jesus draws the crowd, but he speaks to the person. But there's a deeper layer here. Jesus also calls the disciple. Jesus calls the disciple. The last part of this passage of scripture, it says that Peter says, depart from me because I am a sinner. And they're overwhelmed. They're, wow, their heads are blown. I mean, it's crazy. But Jesus says to them, do not fear. Do not fear. From now on, you will be fishers of men. You will be, uh, you will be fishing for men. And then the next sentence is, that Peter parked his boat. I don't think you park a boat, but you get the general idea. He, he, he docks his boat. He brings his boat in. He drops his nets. And he follows Jesus. Now, here's the question for us to think about this morning. Who's this passage of Scripture for? Is this passage of Scripture, the calling to be a fisher of men who drops your nets and follows Jesus, is that a passage of Scripture that's just Peter's story? It's just for Peter. This is what happened to Peter. In case anyone asks you, this happened to Peter. This is Peter's story. Or maybe we can broaden that passage out a little bit. And this passage is for everyone who is called to ministry. And so just kind of know that maybe one day someone you know might be called to ministry. Maybe one day you'll be called to ministry. And this is a type of a passage of scripture that applies to you, a person who is called to ministry. Drop your nets and follow Jesus. But what if this is a passage of scripture that applies to everyone? What if this is a passage of scripture that says, no, this is what I expect every person to do? Now, in the first service, I got a little clumsy here, and hopefully it's going to go better just now. You can check it later and watch both of them. Like you wouldn't do that. Come on, you might want to do that. Here's the question. Does following Jesus mean that I'm supposed to quit my job today? Now, some of you may say, well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready. Just give me, I'm ready to quit this one. Here's the thing. I believe that most of Scripture, the vast majority of Scripture, is written to you, the believer in Christ. And so there's a little bit in this passage, a little bit that applies to Peter, a little bit in this passage that applies to a person who's called to ministry. But I think that one of the mistakes that we have made is that we have driven this wedge and this division between what it means to be a person who's called to ministry and a person who's just called to be a believer in Christ. And we've separated these things and say, well, you know, there's the, there, there, there's the super Christian who's called to ministry and then there's the regular ones that we don't really have to do as, as much. I want you to know that I believe that the application to drop your nets and follow me is to every single believer. Now, again, coming back to your job, does this mean you're supposed to... Text your boss right now and say, I quit before you text. Let's, let's finish the sentence here. I think there's a good chance that when you pick up your net, your, when, you, when you follow Jesus, that one of the things he wants you to do is he wants you to be a better employee or employer or boss or supervisor or worker or student than you've ever been before in your life. I, I think that's one of the first things that he wants, that he wants you to do. But what I do think that he wants to do is I think he wants you to take your job. I think he wants you to put it on a different shelf than it's ever been before. I think he wants you to take every part of your life and put it on a different shelf than it's ever been before. See, I think that there's a shelf that says these things matter more than Jesus and there's a shelf that says these things matter less than Jesus. And we've got a lot of things on the shelf that says this matters more than Jesus. 
Jesus, I'll follow you here. I'll do this and this and this. But if it bumps into these things, well, these things kind of matter more. And sometimes we might come to the place and say, well, Jesus, I would do that but my job. Well, Jesus says, listen, I want you to take your job. I want you to take your vocation. I want you to take your relationships. I want you to take your dreams. I want you to take your, vi- your finances. I want you to take your, your friends. I want you to take all of those things that are on the shelf that says this matters more than Jesus. And I want you to put it on the shelf that says this matters less than Jesus. And so, if he were to say, give up that job, it's already taken care of. Because you've already said, that's a less than Jesus thing in my life. Here's the goal that we have for our lives. We want to clear everything in our life so that it's on that shelf that says, less than Jesus less than Jesus. And so that we come to the place in which we look at that shelf and says, these are the things that matter more than Jesus. And it's empty. That's where I want to get in my life. That's where I want you to get in your life. Now here's the thing. These shelves are almost like whack-a-moles. Maybe you take it off off that shelf and put it on the shelf that says this is less than Jesus and then all of a sudden something happens. You get a phone call, you get a call, you get a worry, you get something. Boom, it's on the wrong shelf again. And so you got to come back and you got to move it off of that shelf. You see, I believe that the word disciple is the best word for a follower of Jesus. It is someone who is trying to get as close to Jesus, to be like Jesus as much as possible. We're using the the idea of follower, same idea as disciple. Man, to begin to live your life as close to arm's reach to Jesus as you possibly can. And if Jesus snores, you would hear it. That's where we want to live. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, oh man, I want this to be true in my life. Lord, I want this to be true in the life of the people across this congregation. Lord, I I want when someone walks into this church, they can sense, whoa, these people follow Jesus up close. These people are so teachable by Jesus. These people's lives are being rearranged by Jesus all the time. Oh, Lord, would you call us to do that? Would you make that possible inside of our lives? We pray this in your name. Amen. Before we stand, I want to think about the what now real quick. The what now is, if you're here this morning and you need to move from just being attracted to Jesus or being fascinated by Jesus or being amazed by Jesus, Maybe you know the name Jesus, you know the stories of Jesus, but you've never had that moment where you fell on your knees in the boat and said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Would you, would you fix that in my life? If you've never had that moment, if you've never had that transition from being, over, over, from being amazed to overwhelmed, we want you to have that. You do that just by opening up your heart and say, Jesus, my life is now your life. My mess is yours for you to clean up and to remove. And man, it's the turning point of life. And if you've never done that, would you do that? Would you take advantage of the next few minutes? And would you do that? And then secondly, believer, disciple, follower, would you make a quick inventory of life? Would you check those shelves? Would you identify one, maybe two, but for today, maybe just one? What's one thing in your life that's on the wrong shelf? That you have a conversation with Jesus today and say, Jesus, I'm moving now. And it's going to go to a less than instead of a more than shelf. Maybe you need to come and mark that moment by praying down front. Maybe you need to make a note of your Bible, make a note of the sermon outline in the bulletin, however you deal with it. But if he tells you something today, move.
that shelf. Man, would you do it? Would you do it? Lead us as we respond. amongst us. I hope that you can feel that. I hope that you can sense that. I, I sense that and I'm really grateful for that. Let me mention just a couple of real quick uh, announcements uh, today. We had a great work day yesterday. A bunch of you were part of that. Uh, one of the things we got done is that we cleaned the steeple. And when I say we, I mean somebody else. Uh, but it got, got taken care of. I hope you noticed that as you came in. Lots and lots of great work uh, that got done. We have a couple other projects that we're going to be working on over the next month or so. Uh, great stuff uh, happening here at church. But thank you for being part 
part of that. We'll do it again sometime. You'll get a chance to come be uh, part of that. Uh, we're making one little change in the facilities. Uh, in the back here, we've got this little driveway. Well, it's not. Uh, just part of security, we're going to put some chains up there. So just as we got kids running back and forth between the two buildings, so, so we're going to try to shut that down from traffic. And so next Sunday when you come, probably even Wednesday night when you come, uh, there's going to be a yellow chain link uh, fence there uh, that's going to be across there just as a reminder. I don't think we have a ton of traffic back there, and I know that some folks go around the backside and park on the backside. That's great. But just because that's a traffic space for kids uh, and some grown-ups, uh, we just want to kind of say that when we got kids, and folks here, we're not going to use that as an open space. So just be aware of that. So if you come flying through there, it may scrape up your car. Um, <laughs> but I told you, so I mean, it, we're even, so it's there. Uh, let's see here. One of the things I was going to talk about, uh, lots of good stuff in your bulletin. Take a look at that. Make sure you've liked us on Facebook so you can see announcements that are happening there. Uh, the last thing that we have is that this weekend is, uh, this coming weekend is our D-Now uh, event. And so uh, we're going to pray for our D-Now team and our D-Now folks. And so if you're going to be part of D-Now as a student, as a host, as a cook, as a, uh, as a team leader, uh, as, as a leader, uh, would you stand right now, our, our D-Now uh, people? Man, love, 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 love what God's going to do uh, in these folks. So let's, uh, let's just pray for them right now. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you for the young people that you have given to our church. Lord, we thank you for their families. Lord, we thank you that this is a church that reaches across the age groups. And Lord, many of us have memories of how you taught us and put foundational stuff inside of our lives when we were teenagers. And Lord, we want that to continue to be true in the lives of these kids. And so in this discipleship intensive weekend, Lord, where they'll be spending many, many hours together and really saturated in the word, Lord, I pray that you would do deep and new things in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would raise their vision of expectation of who they can be inside of you. Lord, I pray that you would heal some broken places inside of their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would unfold the next step of their spiritual life for them. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Billy. We pray that you'd be with the parents that work with Billy. Lord, we pray that you'd be with those other team leaders, uh, group leaders that are going to be working with these kids. We thank you for the folks that have opened up their home to this event. Lord, we pray that you would bless all of these things. We pray this in your name. Amen. We love you kids. We're going to be praying for you. All right. My wife lands at New Orleans International Airport in 20 minutes. And so I'm out of here. You all finish it up. Yeah, let's stand and sing on our way out. <laughs>